What's up, everybody? And welcome back to the Verzi Effect Podcast Show. My name is Paul Verzi, and today is Thursday, May 7th. 2020, and uh, I have a guest for you guys. You guys listen to episode 446, by the way, um, and I have an episode uh, that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, you guys know this man from many things. Uh, as a former wide receiver in the NFL with the Seahawks, with the Vikings, with the Detroit Lions, now a host on Good Morning Football, which I've been on multiple times, and a host of CBS's NFL Today, the one and only, one of my favorites out there, uh, Nate Burleson. What's up, man? Thank you so much for being on the show. Of course, bro. Was this episode four, four, six? Is yeah. that what you're doing? And I'm with that. Hey, listen, I appreciate you. Let me get this out the way so I don't have to get to it. Um, as you know, the many times we've talked in person over text message, I'm a, I'm a big fan of comedy because um, just like Dave Chappelle said, it's it's the last uh, form of free speech. So for guys that can put everything out there on the line, and I know we'll get to this in this conversation. I appreciate that much more than just the average football player doing what he's been told to do his whole life because there's a certain risk that people take in comedy. So when you come on a show and I fanboy out, that's all authentic, man. So I appreciate you, bro. Thanks for having me on. Oh, dude, man, that's that's that means a lot coming from you. And I'm the same way. You know what's funny is they say like a lot of comedians – want to be there's like a lot of comedians that want to be musicians or would have been musicians right they play guitar they play drums and they do all that uh they fan out when they see that me it was always sports because believe it or not i'm five foot eight but i could play i got a always had a jump shot I always tell could, you build bro yeah always could play football always could uh you know, and, and I just when I see people that did it at that level. Now, you played you played in the league for 11 seasons? 11 seasons, yeah. And uh, so, and you got drafted uh, where? Yeah, I got drafted to the Minnesota Vikings in 2003. They, they had Randy Moss. And at that time, which is crazy, like, not too many guys can tell this story, but, like, I was drafted to a team that had the best in the business. You know, there's only a few guys every year that can, like, say that. You know, like, for yeah. – um, uh, the, the, the young running back who just got drafted to the Chiefs, he could say, oh, I got drafted to the team that has the best quarterback because it's Pat Mahomes. But for me, like walking in that locker room as a third round draft pick, drafted as a wide receiver on a team that has a wide receiver that is the most feared man in the planet. And that was Randy Moss. Uh, it's funny you say that. Randy Moss is my favorite. And I, am I crazy to say this? And, and I want to know from, from somebody who did it, and it was in the league. Am I crazy to say that even though Randy Moss not might not be as overall great as far as work ethic and all that, like what Jerry Rice did, but was more talented than anybody that's ever done it, including Jerry Rice, as far as athletic talent? You know what I like about our conversations? It forces me to think about things that I've never thought about. But as you ask me that question, something popped in my head that I, I've never said out loud, and hopefully it comes out correctly. So um, Jordan, to me, is the best player, overall player ever. Like, I was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s, influenced by the 2000s. So Jordan, to me, is the best overall player ever. But I would not, I would not in a million years want to see Vince Carter on a fast break. Like, I'd rather test my ability to block a dunk over Jordan than Vince. Vince was just vicious in the air. He had way more hops. He was way more aggressive. He was trying to take your soul when he dunked on you. The reason I say all that, so I can bring it full circle. Yeah. Jerry Rice is the GOAT. Like, he's the GOAT. But I would not want to see Randy Moss as a defender. So, like, for, for you to say, like, yo, is he, like, I know respect due to Jerry. and There's so many guys that we can appreciate for the number of stats and accolades. But is Randy the best? I look at it like that. Like, if you're guarding a guy one on one, what pumps more fear in you? Like, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of horror. Like we, I mean, comedy. Like we said, but I love horror flicks because it it kind of like ignites a feeling in you that we don't tap into. It's that like that nervousness, those goosebumps, your heart starts <laughs> racing. Yeah, you're, sweating, you're like, oh shit, is there a boogeyman under the bed? So like that that is a feeling that the normal human doesn't tap into. Now let me take everybody into the locker room, take them onto the field, take them onto the basketball court. 
the same feeling that you get when you're watching those scary movies is the same thing a grown man gets when he's guarding Randy Moss. Like he's sitting there, <laughs> literally, literally on, and I'm not, bro, I'm not even joking. And this, funny. this is not even me telling a story. I was on the field with Randy as a young player, second year dude, I'm in the slot, right? I'm, I'm the young up and coming. Randy done, he done indoctrinated me in. He's like, yo, you next up. He done hit me with the, you gonna be my running mate. So at this point, I'm feeling like the Robin to his Batman. Yeah. There were games where I'd be in the slot and I'm looking at Randy Moss. Randy is lined up up against the DB. Now, if, if, if my height in this camera is the regular receiver height, just me standing completely erect, that's what most receivers would sit there and, and be. Randy would be so tall in his stance that you would think to yourself, there's no way you can run full speed from that start. You know, as an as a athlete, you need to get in like some type of like athletic position. Randy would be standing straight up. I'm talking about so far erect. And I would look at the two things that caught my eye, the eyes and the heels of the DB. This is, this is me, 22 years old, in a real-life NFL game. Not a preseason. <laughs> we're talking about, not a practice, regular season game. I'm looking over, and I see the whites of this DB's eyes. Wow. This is, this is a, a guy who's paid a million dollars to stop all the best receivers, who talks a lot of crap all week. And then I see, and the reason I brought up his heels is because I see his <laughs> heels on the ground. <laughs> Anybody that played sports knows the balls of your feet are supposed to be how you move and react. Yeah. This DB is, is showing me the whites of his eyes and his heels on the ground, which means he's scared shitless, and he also is ready to backpedal out of there. So, like, I get it. Jerry Rice was uh, – he was unbelievable. But Randy pumped a different type of fear in grown yeah. men. So, I agree with you. Uh, Randy, I remember seeing him as a rookie on Monday Night Football Lambeau Field and the show that he put on, uh, the show that he put on there under those lights, like it was really watching him. And then even later in his career when they called him a slouch and, then, and then he caught that ball with one hand, he said, well, let's see what this slouch could do. Um, yeah, he's a special, like to me, and here's, you'll love this story. I'm at Giant Stadium. And it was the giant stadium at the time. And it was when they were going for 16 and 0. Mm. And they ended up beating us 38 35 because Eli made one mistake in that game. And that was the game where Tom Coughlin won the team because he Strahan and Tuck told the story about how he said, I know we're already in the playoffs against the Buccaneers, but we're stopping the streak. And they said when he said that, but I'll never forget Tom Brady. For the, for the record. Remember, he threw the record for touchdowns yeah. and the yeah. record for the cat. And I looked at my buddy next to me, and I go, why is Randy single covered? And, and, and I swear, I, I, I go, why is Randy? And I just looked at it, and Tom just did what he did, and Randy caught it. And I never – that 2007 – that 2007 offense, I know it didn't put up the most points because I think – was it what, – what beat it? The 15 um, Packers? I know one of those – yeah, I think the 15 Packers, but – I've never seen a well-oiled machine even walk to the line of scrimmage like that 07 team. And with Randy there and Tom, it's – I mean, listen, I'm glad my Giants did what they did in that Super Bowl, but that was one of the scariest teams I've ever seen. No doubt about it. And let me ask you this, because I like the fact that this is a conversation. Um, I, as a fan, I'm so far from move, removed from when I played that I I just look at the – I look at the game like I did when I grew up, so I don't – I don't really like, I don't sit in a crowd or sit at home and I'm like, oh, I know what's going to happen. I've had those moments where I'm literally looking at the game as a fan. I'm like, yo, why, why is the X receiver sitting there single cover? Or you're like, or you're like, are they really going to bring this blitz on the third down? And I'm looking, talking to my friends, like everything's regular. And my friends will remind me like, of course, Nate, you saw that coming. But in that moment, a big game, two major teams, you're sitting there. When you turn over to your friend and you're like, yo, like, is it, isn't it like a, it's like six cents or like, it's like a surreal feeling. It's like, it's like all of your love and education for the game has connected to like, it's like a, the avatar, like how they say, like everything runs from the earth. Like in that moment, you're like, I see this. Do, 
Do we not all see this? I can't believe you just said that because, and that's really weird you just said that because my buddy looked at me afterwards. I felt it, but I had multiple occasions at Yankee Stadium. I want to say um, three different occasions. One time I was at Yankee Stadium and I looked at the batter. I tapped my buddy on the shoulder and I said, stand up right now, he's going yard. And I swear to you on my children. The next pitch he went yard and my buddy's looking up at me. I love sports. NFL for me is number NFL for me is number one just because I love the action. Yeah. I think it was made for TV. I really believe the NFL for television is, you know, a lot of people don't like it uh live or whatever. And I go, why? It's theatrical, it's theatrical man. It's 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 just an amazing, it's an amazing thing. But one thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is crazy to me, is let's say a guy's got good hands, the mm -hmm. best hands. Mm -hmm. Um and, and it's nice because comedy and sports, believe it or not, the, the, the hotels and the traveling from your family, you know, it's that we go to a, a, a club, tell jokes, make right. people laugh, and then we go back. You guys are going to play a game. So there's a lot of similarities, and we're going to get into all that. But this is what's crazy to me. You could have a guy, great hands. Um, everybody's like, this guy catches everything. This guy runs routes like, a, like an all-pro would run routes, unfortunately. Yeah. He runs a four seven something. That guy's not making it to the NFL, is he? I would have to disagree. He will. I I, I agree. I no, agree. I'm asking. I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I would have. I I I agree with that that statement because a lot of people make it up to the point where it's like that guy won't make it. Um, one. Let me let me take a, a quick step back. Let's let's make sure we get to the similarities between playing a football game and stand up comedy because I I really want to touch on that. But when it comes to um, players that aren't the fastest on the field, I was trying to figure out a time, like a certain time, a time frame you can fall within. And I can tell you, like with 100% of like my gut and my spirit that you can make the NFL if you're a good route runner. And I think, I want to say, bro, I want to say 4-7. I feel like four seven is the slowest you can be if you're a really good route runner. And the reason I say that, there was a wide receiver that I played with in college, this white dude, it's not a skin color thing, but it's white dude, undersized. And he wasn't like Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, Amendola, white undersized, because those dudes, those are some of the fittest dudes I've ever seen in the world. Like yeah. they were just like, you, they take their shirt off and they got abs for days and they're just cut and they're whipped and they're quick. He was like, he should have probably been a lineman, but he was too small. Right. Like big ankles, like he kind of had a gut. And he was an older player on my team when I came in as a freshman in Nevada. And every practice, he would get open. And, and Paul, when I say every practice, I mean when routes came for one-on-ones, he's playing against our fastest, our best DB. He was just cooking them. And every time he got off the line of scrimmage, every route, the first five steps, Every route looked the same. And then at the top of his route, it wasn't like, let me make a break and go somewhere. It was like, I'm going to make sure you look at my leg, my hip, my shoulder, my head, and I'm going to give you more of that. And you're going to go where I want you to go so I can go where I need to go. Wow. And I watched him every single day, and I thought to myself, damn, like I could jump 13 inches higher than him in the vertical. <laughs> I'm running close to a 4-4. I have good hands, good instinct. I actually loved the game, and he was super cool with me. He was just like, yo, if you run routes with your athletic ability, you'll always be open. And you know how you hear receivers say that, or Chad Johnson when he was playing, he was like, I'm always open. Like, you think, man, this dude's an asshole. He's just a wide receiver who's a diva. But there's certain guys, if they, if they like, hit that, like, that, that perfect, like, that, 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 that combination of route running, and athleticism, like you're you're great. And I'll give you prime examples. Calvin Johnson, he hit, he hit it. He hit that like work ethic and size and weight and speed and strength. Um, Julio Jones, you ever wonder why Julio Jones looks like a DN? But like when he has his mind right and he's a route runner, nobody can stop him. So like to answer your question in a very long winded way, you don't have to be tall, you don't have to be fast, you don't have to be the quickest guy in the world, but if you're a route runner, mm -hmm. I promise you, you'll get open. I promise you. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. So, so you say, but like then once you're getting into four eights, four nines, you ain't, you can't do it. 
No, 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 no. 4H, 4 nines, you, you got to go kick her because if you're, if you're, and I don't care, I don't care what, what race you are. If you, if you are 4A, 4 nine and athletic, in your mind you're athletic, man, kick that rock. You last you know, 50 years. You know what I'm saying? For real. I was actually talking to uh, Pat McCaffrey. Uh, yeah. I did his, I did Pat McCaffrey's podcast and um, I said to him, I go, are you looking at this going like I couldn't beat in that action, but I could do what I do. He said, first time he had live NFL game, like you, like you said when you were across from Randy and you're like, this is crazy. He said he just saw how fast and crazy, and he's like, I don't belong <laughs> in that. Hey, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, because I feel like this is um, somewhere where we can talk. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not insinuating anything, and I'm not asking for a specific answer, but – Something happened last year, right? So Zach Ertz, who's a fantastic tight end, mm -hmm. his wife came on the show, right? And she was celebrating uh, the U.S. women's soccer and the year that they had. And, I, of course, we're celebratory. My wife was a collegiate track star. So um, without my wife, there ain't no Nate B. Like, I, you know, women rule the world. And I tell my wife all the time, you got something that I don't got, and I love it. So you are the most beautiful thing in the world to me. Sure. And and intelligent and um and the mother of my children so julie Ertz, she came on the show and she can kick like she can super kick like <laughs> beast super she, duper kick yeah so on the show i'm doing my whole like yo like i got a daughter that's nine i just love the fact that like you are along with my wife a representation that women can do anything i don't care about like the the restrictions that society puts on women like you can do anything and not to mention like when it all comes down to it if if you trace back any type of success from any type of man there's a woman behind it period so you can't tell me that women don't run things but then my boy was telling me he texted me and he was like yo what's up with you like going extra hard with the women thing and the soccer and the field goals with julie Ertz? and i was like what do you mean he's like no i get it you got a daughter and i get it the women's soccer team did their thing he was like, but you honestly believe that Julie Ertz can kick in the league? And I was like, oh, I haven't really thought about it that much. I just feel like if she can get the kickoff, if she can hit 55, then yeah, she's good. And then he said, have you thought about the fact that when those 300 pounders break through the line and they start breathing on you, that's a different type of energy that she has never felt when it comes to soccer. They're physical, but they ain't football and pads, 300 pounder physical. Yeah. So let me ask you, do you think that it is possible for a woman, and I'm putting pressure on you because you put pressure on me, that a woman can kick past college and kick in the league? I don't think so. And I don't think so because I, the only issue that I have is, and it's not a sexist thing. It's actually a bone structure thing. It's a, it's a, it's a bones. It's the skeletal, it's the human skeleton. And if a D, if a D, not, a, not it wouldn't be a, who actually, yeah, defensive back, whoever comes yeah, through. DN. Yeah, DN, a linebacker, yeah. If somebody just comes through and breaks through and he, that, their job is to, Go after and 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 something. I never happened. thought about that. That's a good point, bro. Yeah. I so when people say like, should a woman play? Could a woman play? I'm never gonna be like, well, no, she can't kick. No, you you're right. If she pins 55 every time, if she can, if she can get it down there <laughs> inside the 10, like right. like a dude can. Great. The thing is, I just feel like if something happened, if there's a broken play, and then she gets hurt just because she's physically not you know not able to. To do it. I thought you were going to go somewhere else. I thought you were going to say, now, what do you feel about women in comedy? And I was like, oh, then you're really putting pressure on me. <laughs> nah, nah, I'm not going to ask you about Amy Schumer. But, but, but I got it. I got it. This is hilarious. That's great. I got a hilarious story. <laughs> my mother used to live uh, through the, through my mother's backwoods was a junior high school where my mom, where, where my mom used to live. I didn't go there, but they moved there. And it was a junior high school. And my younger brother, and younger sister went to this junior high school and they had goalposts out. So sometimes we would go, hey man, you wanna just grab a football? And like in the snow, you wanna just go right. kick field goals, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd kick like, you know, we get to like 25 to 35 yards if we hit a good one. We get, and we're there one day, it's nice out, and we're kicking field goals and we're missing. And I'm missing, my brother's bigger than me, missing, missing. I, this is, I swear to God, these two girls walk by, 
in like UGG type boots. And they were like backpacks and seventh and eighth grade girls. And we're like at the 20 kicking. And we're making, and she goes, hey, could we try? I swear to God, this girl walked up in UGG boots. She, she didn't kick on Ooh. the side. She kicked straight. And she kicked, she put her backpack down. We held it. Boom. And it went through. And she just put her backpack on and just kept walking. And I'll never, it was the, it was, I never felt less of a man. And I never, but I was also like, it was the most gangster shit that's just like, it was, it was so, I was just like, that was the most gangster. And I'm glad I have somewhere to tell that story to, because I'll tell friends, you know, if we smoke a cigar, but I'm glad that I'm telling you. But I think, yeah, women are, um, women, look at what they can do in the U.S. Some of those women in the UFC, man, like. Oh my God, forget they, about it. They would beat up an NFL player. Forget about it, bro. Like that, 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 the, these, these young ladies who, display their athletic ability especially hey, you mentioned it the ufc mma i'll be watching some of them fights and i'm like i'm straight i don't, I don't want no smoke <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want no smoke so i want to talk about comedy too with you what's up you're somebody that could do i, I believe this and i'm not just saying this you have this thing that i always said eminem has the rapper mm. eminem could have been there's absolutely no doubt in my mind i've been doing stand-up comedy total since the first time i ever picked up a microphone 20 oh, years yeah, hold on. oh it's all good uh, all right there you go go ahead my bad um no it's all good so i said eminem is one of those people and there's no doubt in my i've been doing stand-up comedy for 20 years since i first did an open mic i've been a professional for about 16 years Seven, almost 17 years. There's no doubt in my mind if Eminem decided to not rap and become a great stand-up comic, he would have. You're one of those guys that if you wanted to rap, you could have. If you wanted to probably play basketball, because I saw you on, on 4th Street in the cage. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that you, I see how you kind of fuck around with uh, impressions. Right, and right, I see right. how you and you could be goofy and silly and right. you're one of those people and it's amazing because there is a you might not know this there's a competitive thing in comedy like when you first when you first got to the league and you're sitting there and you're with Randy Moss and that's one of the top guys now mm -hmm. Bill Burr right now is like it's basically like Chappelle Bill was Louie you know, Louie went through some, right. you know, all that stuff. But there was, like, a handful of guys right. that were, like, those were the guys. And right. for me, Burr took me under his wing. I opened for him, opened for him at the Garden. But I see how you conduct your business. I see, you know, me, I have that. I want to get better every year. I want right. to do that, and I want to do that. So you would have probably taken, if you were to do comedy, Nate Burleson, mm -hmm. <laughs> you would have taken that and you would your competitiveness – but right. you have the personality of, you're actually one of the rarest, and this is another reason I wanted to talk to you. You're one of the rarest ex-athletes that I've met. And, and, yeah. and, and I, I say that with such, as such a compliment because it's very rare that not only do you get the job at NFL Network doing Good Morning Football, but then CBS is like, yo, this is the guy. So there are certain people that I think another one, is, a, is somebody else that, that you probably call a colleague is, is like a Chris Collinsworth, right? right. Well, right there right, are right. certain guys where you're just like, you're, you're so cool to play because I look at it like this. Jordan, you could tell Jordan's an asshole. You could tell. Right. I mean, I'm watching this documentary with right. my son and I'm so into this doc. By the way, bro, how great is the soundtrack? Bro. How great is the soundtrack? It's, it's, it's I, I, I slice in real quick. It's great because it's not just like them saying, what what year was this filmed in? Let me do the the song of the year from this year. They did like a, a, a Dennis Rodman going to Vegas, and this is ninety six ninety seven, and they did uh, I don't want to be a player no more from Big Pun. I said, oh, okay, that's a choice. It's a lyrical choice, like because bit because Dennis Rodman was like I don't want to be a player. That bro, I agree with you. The, the yeah, I mean. When he went to the garden and then they started playing Nas and Lauren Hill, I was like, it brought me back because that was like, those were like, you know, 10th, 11th grade. That was, that was, that was our time. We yes. the same age, bro. We yeah, yeah, yeah. We're pretty, yeah. So, um, but listen, and I'm going to be honest, and I don't know if, if you have a relationship with him, if you talk to him or whatever, but as a comedian, 
you know, here's what I do. I'm, I'm me and you are similar. We're married. We have kids. Right. So me, I don't go out to clubs. I don't do the strip club thing. What I do is when I'm done my show, if I'm, if I'm doing a show, I find out before time, before like I get there, I, the owner tells me, I said, where's the cigar lounge? Right. I want a cigar lounge and I want a place quiet where the games are on or the highlights are on where I could get a whiskey scotch and a stick. Right. That's what I do. So I was in Atlanta, Georgia, another bad Jordan story. I had Jordan four white cements. The manager looks at me and goes, oh man, those are nice kids. I'll never wear any of those again. That asshole came in here. And I'm like, whoa. And then another place. I mean, I didn't mention any names of the, of the club. <laughs> right, 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 right. Then a flight attendant, then this, then a caddy. And you're hearing like 12 things. And I will, I will say this from the stories I heard about Michael and then the last dance that I'm watching, I actually like him more because of the doc. Like the doc is making me try to erase some of the things I heard. Right. But as a professional athlete, do you think that him being like that is why I almost feel like you need that kind of to be the best, to be that crazy that he's he's gambling with the security in the green room, flicking quarters at the wall to see who could get closer to the wall and take it that seriously. And by the way, when that guy beat him, you know, the guy, he went like this. You yeah. you could tell he was genuinely like, yeah, man, go, go, go guard the, the United Center. Get out of here. He was right. genuinely upset. So. I feel like, um, but I guess there is the opposite because I hear amazing things about Brady and Brady has that. But do you find that the more competitive somebody is in the way that they are, does trance let go over into off the field or off the court? Let me tell you how real this question is. And let me- Really good, I'm glad, I'm glad. Let me, let me first set it up with the conversation I had with one of my former coaches. His name is Sean Jefferson. He was the wide receivers coach for the Detroit Lions. So he coached Calvin Johnson, who was blessed with um, talent beyond this world. And his son actually just got drafted in the second or third round to the Rams as a wide receiver. So a legitimate young player who just got drafted to Sean McVay's team. So that'll tell you right now, like where his lineage is. This is my former wide receiver coach, who I don't know if I mentioned this, played in the NFL, whose son is now playing in the NFL. Okay. Success is in his bloodline. I like talking to people that are in a certain pe place of understanding. Not success, just understanding. You know what I'm going through. So one day, I walk in. It's myself, Calvin, we're chilling. All the young players have yet to filter in. They usually take more time getting treatment, getting lunch, getting their clothes on. It's me, Calvin, and my coach, Sean Jefferson. And this is a story I've never, I've never shared before, at least not in the- um, Oh man, thank you for sharing. So I wanted to know because like, I was thinking about some of the greats that I, I love and I appreciate in the sports realm. So I wanted to know because he played in the era that was like the 90s, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, yo, when it comes to success, because like right now I'm at the end of my career, had a decent, decent lifespan in the NFL. I'm sitting next to Calvin Johnson, who, in my opinion, could do whatever he wants. If he, if he lasts 10 years, there's no doubt he's a Hall of Famer. He could possibly win a Super Bowl. But when it comes to success of guys that came before us, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, um, do you think that there is something to um, being an asshole and also um, – being a little bit of a villain and i'll and i'll i'll leave the the villain as like a ellipsis and let you like let you fill that in okay um, and then and i said and he's like what do you mean they said well think about um tiger woods think about michael jordan think about Wilt chamberlain um the mark mcguire's and barry bonds um, think about Lawrence Taylor. Uh, think about Babe Ruth. Uh, so, and I, and, and as you can probably assume, the details within the description of each individual depends on what your recollection is. Okay. Uh, and, and I was trying to get him to like see my point of view. If you can dominate life, like. 
if you could dominate like just interaction, that means every room, every room you walk into, I'm the big dog. Like I'm yeah. barking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If every every social circle I I exist in, everybody looks at me as if I'm like the sun, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm creating solar power to the energy of the the space. Um, if I can walk into a club or a bar or any type of social setting and the opposite sex looks at me and is like, yo, you are the one I'm gonna stand next to. As if they were like, they were in need of a, a human heater. Yeah. What, what, like how difficult really is athletics? So the point I'm trying to make is if, uh, if like Jordan being a jerk and whatever, whatever, but like, Jordan conquered every space. His first five years in the league, he was uh, all-star, all-star MVP, scoring leader, defensive uh, MVP of the league. He was all of these things, and not to mention he was he was uh, Gatorade, Nike, Haynes. He did all these things. At some point, because life has been conquered, the most difficult thing, which was supposed to be the sport you're playing, becomes easy. If that makes sense at all, this yeah. is an athlete thinking about the greatest athletes I've ever seen. So I thought one day when I was just sitting back chilling, had a drink, and I was like, yo, is there something to the, the greatest players we've ever like witnessed and the ones that we praise that once they conquered a certain level of like life existence, the job that is hard to the masses became easy to them? Like once Ali realized like my feet are quicker, my hands are quicker, and my mouth is quicker, like, I can literally hit you in one. Once Mike Tyson, who admittedly was just on a tear in life in general, in, in general, we're talking life. Paul, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Once he started to, like, conquer life, knocking a grown man out who is probably top 15 in the world of yeah. strength and, and chaos, yeah. like, I think, I think, like, you get to a point where these guys, they have to cross a certain threshold. And yeah. once they, if they're athletic and gifted enough, once they cross, cross that threshold, they are, it's almost like they, they can't lose. You know what I'm saying? If that I, makes sense. No, it makes, it makes complete sense. And I'm going to take what you said, I'm going to take it a step further because I noticed something and I really think there's something, there's something to this. What does Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, who else we could say? You could even say Babe Ruth, and I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, who else? Tom, Aaron Rodgers. You want to know what? Michael Jordan got cut in high school. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers got humiliated in that green room during draft day yeah. when they yeah. got the camera on him and his mother, 20-something pick. What, 20 yeah. Tom Brady going for walks with his dad for days, not knowing if he's going to get into the league because he waited till what, the sixth round, right? Yeah. yeah. When somebody with the heart, one of my favorite quotes of all time in sports, well, my, I have two actually, John Wooden, John Wooden said, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then um, the other one was, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, Rudy Tomjanovich said, never underestimate the heart of a champion. Yeah. And Aaron Rodgers, I'll never forget, man. He actually was at a show. He was at a show and we hung out afterwards. He was in, at, a, at a comedy show in Green Bay. And the dude just had this thing about him that was like, there was a calmness and a coolness, dry sense of humor, but you could just see the dude has that. I'm going to, there's certain people you look at, you're like, oh, that guy, there's someone, even when he they got it. He got yeah, it. Yeah, he got it. And, you know, Brady probably still thinks about going to the sixth round. And, and, and Jordan, you saw what Jordan did during his Hall of Fame speech. He's holding that shit. He's, he's, he brought people to his Hall of Fame speech to shit on him. It might as well be tattooed on him. Yeah, he can't handle it. And it's the same thing with flicking a quarter closest to the wall with the security guard. Those guys just have it. And I noticed that. And I'll be honest with you, man. Like, it took me 15 years in stand-up comedy for anybody to give a shit about me, Nate. 15 for someone to go, 
wow, this dude's funny. Then get a special on Comedy Central. Then want getting some acting roles. And then people going, hey, man, we're going to do another special. And I'm going, I was always here, but you know what? It was... For whatever reason, it was somebody's not castable. Oh, you know what? This comedy, this comedy thing, they're looking for this, they're looking for that. When I was killing, and somebody always told me, they're like, you're going to have to just be undeniable so much because some guys just have the thing, the longer route. And then now that um, things have happened over, I would say, the last four and a half years of my career, and it's like, I'm hungrier now than ever. My next special, which we're about to do, um, is better than the last. And the, and the first one was better than the album. And it's like, I feel like a guy like that, Brady, Jeter, Jordan, um, they called, what's it? They used to make fun of, what's his name, was bullied. Babe Ruth was bullied, called yeah. fat. Yeah. But, and, and, and now, I mean, you could argue, somebody made a good point to me. Somebody said Babe Ruth could be the reason that, that started, one of the big reasons that started American sports. He was one of the first people to make crowds gather to see something that they heard about. What, 19, early 1900s, people, like mm. crowds. The first yeah. like athlete to go. So um, I think that there's a tenacity in being disappointed young when you have it in you. I think you do have to be the guy. Like you said, you gotta no, have it. No doubt about it. But then there's something when you get hurt like that and you're like, I'm gonna, Michael Jordan could have stopped playing, right? If, after he got cut. No doubt about it, he could have stopped playing. And he decided, you know what? Nah, I got something that I believe in. I'm going to ride this through. Yeah, it's crazy. Who is the best? This is one I wanted to ask you. Who's the best? Who's the biggest winner like that that you were around in your career? You know, it's crazy. I would say um, Dante Culpepper. Dante Culpepper was from Ocala, Florida, which, as he described it to me, was country hood the south and he um he constantly talked about himself like he was like he was jordan he like randy moss is quiet he was a he was my understanding is i feel like randy moss is an introvert but when it came to pep like dante was a talker so like he had this like ability to make you believe something about yourself that you weren't already thinking which is, I think that's one of the first characteristics of a, a leader or a champion. Yeah. Um, the, you know, there's a reason why the, the, the Bulls are so recognizable outside of Jordan because Jordan made these guys feel like exaggerated versions of themselves. There's a reason why yeah. we know the Patriots as Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and the Patriots. Because for some reason, we have learned to appreciate the talents of these guys that were lesser known individuals. Dante was that dude. I remember he walked in the hood one time. He's like, yo, yo, you ready? And I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. What's up? He's like, yo, they probably going to double Randy. So, like, I need you to be Randy. I'm like, yeah, I'm not Randy. We're joking. This is all NFL banter. And, and I'm laughing. I'm walking away from the huddle, jogging to the line of scrimmage. And he was like. I'm gonna throw you the ball, score a touchdown. <laughs> and then he cut through the he cut through the bullshit and was like, yo, like, all right, for, forget what I just said to you, Huddle. Like, I need you to be a man right now. And I did. Wow. I scored a touchdown. And I remember him like seeing me afterwards on the sideline. He dabbed me up and he looked at me. He looked at me like I was special. And in my head, think about a rookie who is like literally just fighting for scraps. You know, when you're young. Paul, you know this. You'll see your your OGs around other OGs, and you're literally just picking up on conversation and body language. And if they look at you or include you or give you a nickname or say something to you in the same vein that they do the other greats, it yeah. makes you feel so special. And people who front and act like that don't happen, they they lying because like we're all like we're all just like we're grown children wrapped in this like adult body. So like he looked at me and. I was like, damn, like, that's how he looked at Randy after he just scored a touchdown. Yeah. So in my head, and mind you, like as an adult, having kids and understanding what it's like to find different ways to motivate people, I know, I know he did that on purpose. I know it. Yeah. It was like, now I can appreciate it. I wish I could talk to a 21-year-old name and be like, yo, you see the genius in your quarterback? He's literally like giving you false body language 
to make sure you believe in like who you really are. That's that, that's what you said is that's what a leader does. And that's what a leader and, and, and it is like the bulls. Cause that's what Jordan did. I think Jordan definitely the best example is what he did with Pippen. But um, mm-hmm. you know, like you said, the OGs, I've had some of the best, when some of the best comedians in the world, somebody hit me up and then they tell me like, yo, one of the best comedians in the world just said, yo, Paul Verzi's a beast. He said that on his podcast, said, yo, you, and, and then like they come up to you and you all of a sudden you get respect from somebody like that. And right, you're, like, right, right. you're like, oh my God, that, that, that's a, that gives you the moment to, to do it. What is your greatest, two, two questions. I know this is a tough question and I, I didn't talk to you about this before, but did you do this? Did you, are you going after, were you going after something? Were you insecure or had to prove something to your father, to your mother, to a friend, to a brother? Like when you were coming up, because they, they were talking about like how Jordan's brother, he just had to beat his brother. I've also heard some other athletes. The Daryl Strawberry one is one of the worst things. I don't know if you ever heard that. Daryl yeah. Strawberry said he's rounding second base at Shea Stadium in the World Series and everyone's going nuts. And he said he felt this big because his father said that he was a piece of shit that was never going to be anything. And he said he felt that going around second base instead of enjoying it. And I'm going, that's so for it's anybody that, how, how crazy is that? And then people are going, how come, man, six times with cocaine, seven times with cocaine? And, and you're like, when somebody is just genuinely not happy, and I know Daryl Strawberry is doing very well now and he's very, you yeah, know, spiritual yeah. and stuff, but. Did you have, was there, were you just naturally gifted or was there some sort of chip where you're like, I got to get out of a situation. I want to prove. Paul, people, people don't realize, you know, in regards to that Daryl Strawberry story, like it doesn't matter, man. Like all of this is fleeting. It's like, it's like we're living in the matrix. You know what I'm saying? So like, if you don't decide to be happy within yourself, you'll always feel like a false reality of yourself, man. So like we hear these stories, you and me, cause bro, like when I meet you, I know you, I see you like, we're, we're very perceptive and we're observant. Like we've seen the life, we lived the life, we've been part of life, you know what I'm saying? So like, we understand it when we hear these stories. People don't, people don't get the fact that like, there's always an origin story. It's, I'm a, I'm a big superhero fan. Right. I'm a big Marvel, DC, and like, you know, uh, Wolverine had his, uh, his, his uh, last movie was a Logan with, with um, what's, what's my guy that, that plays Wolverine? Um, um, British actor, but so um, he he starred in Logan, which was the the X-rated version of the 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 Wolverine cartoon, and they gave him the real name. And it was an origin story of why he's so conflicted and why there's so much pain and why he is who he is. And like, I feel like when it comes to who we are, Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman, that's who it is. I had we, to look it up, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we we all have this origin story. And the reason why that movie was so successful, I think it was like the first R-rated movie to gross over 100 million so fast, is because our origin stories are always the, the definition of why we are who we are. I was a child who was third in the list of four boys. My mom and dad had four boys. And I was the middle child, for what it's worth. And I know what it's like to eat top ramen for two weeks straight. I know what it's like to um, have extra covers on me because our 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 heat gauge was out because we didn't pay our electric bill. I know what it's like to to be broke. Now I'm not saying we grew up poor. I'm not saying we grew up without. What I am saying is my mom and dad worked two jobs most of the time, overtime, and at a young age, I didn't realize top ramen and hot dogs was the cheapest thing. I just thought top ramen and hot dogs was like a delicatessen that my dad Yo, made. Don't sleep on good top ramen though. Hey, bro, <laughs> listen, I, I got top ramen in the pantry <laughs> right now. But what I'm saying is that's my origin story. Sure. And my origin story has created this guy who wanted attention, a third child. I'm three of four athletes in the house. My two older brothers, I looked up to. My younger brother is coming. And you know how they always say, the older brother was the one that should have did more. And they always say, the younger brother was really the most athletic one. So I'm sitting here in the middle like, <laughs> like who, who am I? Yeah. So like, my whole life, I have been trying to, I have been trying to search for validation. And even my wife will tell you right now, like, you have been sitting here trying to fight for validation, whether it comes to 
the 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 people you hang out with, um, the parties you surround yourself with, the 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 stuff that you buy, cars, clothing, jewelry, like I'm all I always have to look in the mirror and I'm 38 to this day. I gotta look in the mirror and be like, why are you making the move that you're making? Are you making it because you want attention? Are you making it because it makes you happy? And yeah, that's yeah. literally because I was I I've at, at certain times in my life, I felt like just that lost middle child. You know what I'm saying? That's just what it is. No, I mean I get mine's not Mine's just bad. I had a really bad, my parents had a brutal, brutal divorce when I was five. My brother was 10. I, I, there was no security. And I just, so yes. Yeah, so when I would go tell funny stories or do impressions or, or people would watch me even reenact a comedy movie and I started, people liked me and laughed because of it. That was my way of getting the attention. And when I had a skill at it, then that was, then it took it to, uh, to another level, which brings me to my next question, which is perfect. We're, uh, yeah, we only got a few more minutes, man. This has been amazing. But, uh, so who's the funniest dude, who is the funniest dude you ever played with as far as like, and he could be talented, but like, who just was like, always just, is it, was there a hilarious football player, whether it was on your team or not? Like, even when you were on the opposing team, and you were just like, this guy is just like, I want to be mad and hate this guy, but he's hilarious. All right, so you're going to like this. So I, I, we talked about him earlier on, and um, you're going to like this because people love silly stories about superstars. Calvin yeah. Johnson was funny, and he was the type of funny that he didn't try. Like, he was an introvert, so he didn't like to talk. He didn't like to say much, um, but there were moments where – you just you would get this like I would get a genuine laugh. I'll give you two examples. Um, we're playing against the Denver Broncos, right? This is the Tim Tebow led Denver Broncos. Now Calvin catches a screen. I'm blocking for Calvin. I'm I'm blocking my cornerback. Calvin's behind me. He gets tackled, and he's getting like folded up. And it's typical for a football play. But there's a guy on his ankles, which is the DB, because they never want to hit him up top. And yeah, there was yeah. a linebacker who was like pulling them behind and doing one of those like like pretzel moves where they yeah. were trying to break him. Not really trying to hurt him or ruin his career, but really like unnecessary and it could hurt him. Um, now, Calvin doesn't say much, never says much. He gets in the huddle and we're sitting there chilling. And uh, so it's like me and Calvin and like, let's say this is me. And not because this is black, but let's just say this is me. <laughs> so, so I'm looking at Calvin and, and, and I'm like, you good? He's like, I'm good. So Matt Stafford comes in, I, I believe it's Matt Stafford, and he, he calls a run play right down the gut. And we're about to uh, score. We're close to the end zone. And he's like, hey, yo, Nate. I'm like, what's up? He's like, um, let, me, uh, let me get the slot. And I'm like, what do you mean get the slot? Because I'm a slot receiver. Yeah. I'm like, but you on the outside. He's like, nah, but let me, we'll switch positions. I'm like, what, what's going on, bro? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, I just got to I gotta get a little payback. That dude, that linebacker, he was trying to hurt me. And I'm like, um, all right, I guess. Like, so, <laughs> now, so now I'm like, now mind you, Calvin's not smiling at me. The me, me, I'm whole time just laughing. I get outside. <clears throat> I'm at receiver. I'm looking down like this. This is one of the few times in my career where I didn't even run around. I didn't go block my dude. I didn't do it because – I was so interested on what Calvin was about to do. I looked down. <laughs> Calvin is like peeking inside, just staring <laughs> down his linebacker. Hi, he runs. He doesn't even block the nickel back in front of him. <laughs> Plants his foot, runs in, and he grabbed this dude, bro, and was just like, boom, and took him down and was slamming him on the ground. Just wow, right? He pretty much had his hands around his neck. Um, and he's just jamming his dude up in the ground because he felt like that guy disrespected him. And it's funny because Calvin's chill. He's nice. He's like a big teddy bear. But in that moment, he was like, yo, I got to get some payback because this dude just tried to disrespect me. Right? So I, I love it. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. That, that was the one moment in my, in my on, on the field days that I loved seeing Calvin step outside his character. Another time, it was my first year in Detroit. We used to do uh, 40 times, vertical jumps, um, bench press, all that stuff. 
um, because the Detroit Lions wanted to know if you were working on the offseason. So I get there. Uh, all the receivers did bench press, 225. You know, it's like we'll tap out around six, seven. Some of the stronger receivers would tap out around like, like 12 or 13. Calvin gets up there. And after jumping a 40, 44 inch vertical, he's like, oh, 15, ugh, 16, ugh, 17. <laughs> now he realizes um, he's like, he's past the mark of like regular receivers. You ever seen like the Incredibles where they were like, Dash, don't run so fast? Yeah. So in his head, he's probably thinking, I'm not going to like embarrass my guys. So he's like this. 18, 19, and he goes, 20. <laughs> and I'm behind him, spotting him. He's like this, 20. So he racks it, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, 20, 20 reps, 225, which is crazy. And I get up, and everybody's like patting him on the back, and we walk over to get some Gatorade. And I was like, bro, what were you doing? He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you could have did like five more. And he's like, this. <laughs> Calvin, so chill. You, this. <laughs> you saw that? And I was like, yeah, I saw that, bro. Like, it, it's, it was like great. a superhero, like, trying to hide his superpowers. It's like, come on, Dude, man. How is that guy not a movie star in Hollywood? Talk about soup. That guy, like, if Calvin, if they said tomorrow Calvin Johnson is the next 007, I would be like, yup. Yeah. He's smooth. He's casual. He graduated with an engineering degree. His mom is a doctor, and his dad worked on the railroads to some some capacity. And like, so he has like this very intellectual side, but he's super blue collar. Like, Calvin's the man. That's my he, dog right there. He's uh he's amazing, dude. And I'll tell you what, man, it was kind of gangster the way he left the league. Real talk. Real talk. It, it was. He was like, you know what? Like the way he did that. Like he wasn't trying to get. He wasn't. He wasn't going to be that boxer that just never got it and got punch drunk. He just, it seemed like he knew his window or he was just like, you know what? I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. It's nice. Well, they say that history repeats itself. Barry Sanders retired after nine years. So did Calvin. Um, once he started thinking about it, the Detroit Lions, from my understanding, basically sent a message through his representation that if he did retire, that he's going to have to pay back a certain amount. And I think that infuriated him. I was like, word? Like, me? A guy that never has cared about his brand or money, like, you're going to make me pay back? And he's just kind of like, all right, well, I'm going to bounce. Like, I've been here nine years and never complained. I, I could have been traded. I could have asked. For, you see how players manipulate their, their, their fate in the league? Calvin didn't do any of that. Yeah. He, he could have been like, yo, trade me. I'm out. But he didn't. Calvin, and this is no lie. This is no lie. Mm -hmm. Calvin... I've known this dude for now, I don't know, um, almost 20 years. I mean, 10 years, I'm sorry, so a decade. When I started playing with Calvin, I used to harass him about money because I was always interested in how people handled their money, how they talked about their money. Yeah. Money controlled them. And he never, when I say never, never talked about or even cared about money. It was all like, man, my agent take care of it. So I know personally... This is a strong statement, especially stay say on any platform. But I don't think Calvin like cared that like he was walking away from football. He knew he was blessed to play it, but it's like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take whatever your expectations are for me and have them ruin the way I look at life. Like he he was aware he was aware that he was way more gifted than everybody. Yeah, it was, it was almost like a burden. You know, when we had conditioning. And Calvin probably wanted to take a break and not run as fast. He knew because God gave him extra. It was like a Madden. He was like a, a, a creative player because God made him faster, <laughs> bigger, stronger. He knew like I gotta, I gotta show everybody like I'm five yards faster than everybody. Yeah. How crazy is that? Every day he feels like he has to be that, and he's probably just got tired. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's funny because like fans are selfish. They want more of greatness. But when that person is like, no, this is not. I'm tapped. You know, Barry yeah. Sanders can walk okay now. Right, right. You know? and, yeah. and there were some guys that were in the league that are running backs that can't, which is, which is crazy. So I just got, um, I want to, somebody asked me to ask you this. Somebody goes, yo, ask Nate 
who he would have loved to play with, if he could have played with anybody that he never got a chance to play with, um, somebody you wish you played with, um, you know, in the league. Uh, the, the person I wish that I played with would probably be on the defensive side of the ball because I fed off energy. So I knew that I was going to bring enough electricity on the offense side of the ball that when I sat down, I was going to be spent. I've always appreciated oh, guys great. that played on defense that, like, when I'm sitting down and the coach is coming over with the game plan, like, look at this, all right, you, you got to make sure, okay, they're picking up the blitz and you got to cook. I always knew, like, I needed to watch something that gave me that, like, that feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for better or for worse, I feel like, I would have loved to see Lawrence Taylor play, man. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was just, he was just different. You know what I'm saying? Like, and also in the sense of being like, I met him a couple of times. We're actually represented by the same agent. Also in the sense, like, if I knew, like, if I was a teammate, like, like maybe he would have been even greater in the sense that he would have fell back from some of the like situations and chaos yeah. that he was susceptible to. And I'm not saying just he, I'm talking about me as well. Like I, I done lived it. I didn't, I done partied and kicked it. So I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a player that played from 2003 to 2014. And I know how crazy like that window of time was. I'm not going to fault him for playing in the eighties when he was at one point the most recognizable athlete in the world. Yeah. Like, I would have loved to have like played with that. You know what I mean? Oh my God. Like, uh, you know, the, the call bank story with the chains. Yeah. I mean, though, though, like, and stuff like that. And I also love when Parcells is like, you guys are complaining about him sleeping in meetings. You play like him on Sunday. You could sleep in meetings too. Hey, listen, we had LT on the show and LT don't do a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, we, we represented by the same agent. Shout out to Mark Lepselter. And, um, he came on, he's chilling. And he relaxed, you know, LT, he just, he shoot from the hip. And he was telling me how, or telling us how Parcells was basically um, yelling at him in the morning meeting about how he didn't show up to curfew and how he came late to the game. And he went out there and had one hell of a game. I'm talking about one hell of a game. Yeah. And so afterwards, Parcells was telling the team, like, you can't, you can't stay out and you can't party all night. And that, I'm literally on live TV and I'm like, man, where's this story going? I'm not tripping. I know my producers is panicking. They're <laughs> like, I don't know what LT gonna say next. Yeah. And he was like, as soon as Parcel said, you can't stay out and party all night and still expect to win. And he said, in real time on live TV, he said, bullshit. I had the game of my life. And like me, I looked to the producers and I'm like, Let's keep this thing rolling. More stories, cause like those are the stories that we want to hear. Oh, a yeah. guy that went out the night before, admittedly said he was hungover and still was the best player on the field. You want to talk about gifted? No, oh, man. His speed and strength. I mean, that there's a seven minute YouTube of his highlights. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a guy jump over the line of scrimmage and grab a quarterback and throw him around like it's like it was a little like it was a high school kid. I've never yeah. seen, I've never seen anything like that. Um, yeah. What is the greatest? We'll wrap it up. We'll do this and then afterwards hang for a second because we'll do yeah, the other. I got you. I got you. I'm not going anywhere. What's the greatest moment of your career? If you if 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 there's one thing that you would never want anybody, everything else gets taken away, but the one thing that you you can say is mine because as a comedian, we have those shows. Yeah. Whether it's a night of a special, whether it's a, at, a, at a big venue, a, a classic historic venue, and, and it's something that obviously I know your children, your wife and kids. Yeah. I'm talking about your career. What's yeah. something that's your number one? I'm curious to know what is yours because I feel like people might assume as comedians it's the special that you tape or this big venue or you know thousands of people sharing your name. I'm curious to know if it, it maybe it isn't that it's 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 a, a smaller venue where this the synergy and the energy was perfect. I don't know, but let me get to my answer um, because my answer is a little bit of the latter. I've had moments. I've had big time touchdowns. I've had playoff touchdowns. I've returned punt returns, ninety plus yards. 
I don't have some moments in my career, but the one I remember is um, I'm playing for the Seahawks. The Bengals are at home or the Bengals are in Seattle. So we're at home. And I, I was thrown two balls by Matt Hasselbeck. This is when I was really trying to earn his respect. I just got there off of a signage of a free agent deal, a restricted free agent. So I was kind of wanted, but not really just being completely realistic with you. The owner wanted me, um, the GM wanted me, Mike Holmgren, the head coach, didn't necessarily want me. Um, Mike Holmgren and I are cool now, but I just know the real. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so he throws it to me in the back of the end zone. I try to toe drag, swag, and the ball hits the ground and pops out. Second one is deep over the middle of the field right before halftime. Um, it's off to my fingertips. Now, as a receiver, I can easily say, yo, that one hit my, literally my fingertips. The other one, the ball caused the fumble. I mean, the ground caused the fumble. So, like, I can, I can tell you how hard it is. I've been the dude that was always raised to not say anything. So I just, like, kept shit quiet, went to the sideline. People were like, yo, what the, mate? Like, <laughs> you a bum, bro? What are you doing? The crowd yelling at me. What are you doing? Oh, bro, see, you suck. And I'm just, like, quiet. I remember Matt Hasselbeck, like, yo, just chill. Like, don't worry about all that. I'm going to come to you later in the game. Fast forward, end of the game, fourth quarter. We're down by, like, five. And the Cincinnati Bengals are playing cover two. We're, like, 30 yards away. Matt Hasselbeck breaks the huddle. We got 989, which is two streaks and a streak up the middle. And I'm on the left side. And I look at this cornerback who's so far inside. But he's so far inside because the safety is cheating over the top. So I'm like, oh, there's a gap. Like, there's a gap between that safety's coverage and the cornerback. If I can get to that gap, I'm talking about just that little pocket shot. If I can get that hole, Matt's going to hit me. And I was thinking, like, as I'm lining up, this is how fast everything works. I'm thinking, like, damn, like, that's that's a pipe dream. Like, Matt, maybe Matt didn't see that coverage like I see it. Wait, that's like, because you thought the safety was too far back? He was too far back, and I knew he couldn't get to the sideline by the time I get there. So I'm like, oh man, whatever. Maybe Matt ain't see it like I see it. Cause this is just me doing my 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 computer science of the of the actual defense. Yeah, yeah. So I look over at Matt and Matt's like this. <laughs> it's, it's the international sign of I'm coming to you. Yeah. For anybody that don't understand football, yeah. You're in a bar and you single and you look over at a girl that's been kind of looking at you. Yeah. And you like hesitant, you like, you know what? You tell your boys like, hey yo, you know what? Nah, nah, she looking at me, I'll be right back. And you look and you look over, <laughs> and she get back at you, she go like this. Yeah. That's the same thing. <laughs> so touch down either way. Yeah. So, look, I run that route, I catch that ball, boom. And the safety's speeding. And he hit me, and as soon as I take the hit, I look down pylon there and I scoot in. And the reason this is special to me. Because of, there's a redemption factor of like me dropping two balls. Like how difficult, who cares? I dropped two balls and my quarterback's sticking with me like I got you. And then more, more importantly, I caught that touchdown and my wife was in a sweep. And like this was the first year I was like really able to like, there's like a, you know how it is. There's a level wow. of like money you make and you're like, I'm going to splurge. This was my like, I'm going to splurge this season. And every single game, I'm like, I don't even know if it's worth it. Cause like I don't get to see her. She's in the she's on the suite on the field. Like, uh -huh. baby, you can't be in the regular regulars. So like, <laughs> so like I, I saw her and as I scored this touchdown, I'm like, oh, there go my baby. And I ran over and I gave her a football and a, I blew a kiss to her. It's on film somewhere, but like, so like it was it, it's a moment in a moment, you know what I'm saying? That was encapsulated by a moment. So that's my very long when no way. that's amazing story that's my story that's my story that, that's that's amazing um yeah mine was guarded mine was mine was um madison square garden okay um yeah mine was madison square garden eighteen thousand people and it was in the round and uh, there was a few of us with, with uh, burr was like i'm doing this thing i want you on this thing and um it's new york it's the garden it's very few comedians have been in there and um, my whole family, everybody is in there. And um, I had a story about my son and I playing one-on-one -on -one basketball 
And I only did the joke one time at the Comedy Cellar and it crushed. And I did it one time at New York Comedy Club and it killed. So everybody's going, you gotta, you gotta do the joke. So I get a phone call from Bill Burr and Burr goes, yo, I was talking to Conan O'Brien and Andy Richter and I told them about that joke with you and Lucas playing basketball. And they were laughing. And I go, yeah, I think that's going to be a piece in a new hour. He goes, it has to be. Then I told another one of my buddies, shout out to Chris Lamberth. We were at a comedy club in New Jersey. And he goes, you should do that at the Garden. And I go, buddy, I go, I only did that twice. Now, in, in comedy rules, you need to know. Right. You, you got to know what's going to hit. You need to test it. Probably, I would say, a good – me, I'm – Sometimes I'm a little rebel. If it hits like four or five times, I'm going to do it. But not at the Garden. I would need like 20 times before I did that's, it at the Garden. That's, that's, whole, that's holy ground, bro. That's... Yeah. I mean, this is and, – and I'm a Knicks fan. I got Ewing's – you know, I got right. – so it's the Garden. And um, I go out there, and I'm like, I'm going to see how the set goes. And if the set's going good, I'm going to close with it. Um, if the set's going all right, I'll figure it out. And Nate, you know, it's documented. People have talked about it. Where I go, what, like, it's it's – People know. And I had the set of my, I had the set of my life um, killing. I mean, when I tell you 18,000 and when I got announced, it was five days after my Comedy Central, Comedy Central special dropped. So some people did know about me and they knew about the podcast and they knew that, you know, and, and I just start boom, boom. And I'm just like, this is, if I went to, this is a dream. A dream is happening right now at the it's garden. Like you're, you're leaving, you're leaving yourself. Like you're, you're, you're in the zone. It's, it was, believe me, I, if it wasn't, I would say, hey, man, I had a good set. Oh, it was okay. It was metaphysical. It was. This was an out of box, and I'm just like everything, and I'm looking around, I'm going, this is crazy. And now I have the set in my life, and I just look around, and I looked up, and I could have said good night, and I just go, fuck it, I'm doing it. And I looked at the crowd, and I go, guys, you know what? I'll never forget. I'm sorry. I know I'm doing it now, but I looked up, and I see the Knicks banners, and I go, you know what, guys? Uh, I got this story about, it's about basketball, and I think it's only fitting since I'm here in the world's most famous arena. I'm a Knicks fan. I'm going to tell this story. And, well, I told the story, and the punchline was my son actually cursing at me playing basketball. The punchline is my son making a shot after I kind of was, like, getting on him. And he just goes, let's fucking go, right? And, the, like, and I did that and everything. And then I said good night. And it was literally like a three-pointer to win a title in that arena. Yeah. And I remember going into the green room and they got all kinds of drinks. And Chris Rock and Quest Love were there. Damn. And apparently somebody said, yo, and Burr killed. Burr went on and killed. He did his hour. And somebody said, Chris Rock goes, yo, his boy that opened, his boys that opened, killed and burr's like one of the new kings or something and then chris rock and, and Questlove like walked by and just looked at me and i just remember i just know that that moment and i'm sitting there with a the drink and then my wife comes in and my wife brought some girlfriends and all these people and i just remember being like i wasn't in myself it was just like the craziest like it was like a dream of everything that i ever yeah. from standing on soda crates in bars in new jersey literally standing on a coca-cola crate in a bar in Jersey trying to tell jokes over people eating and games on and to yeah. now be in there and having all these agents and everybody and my special had just dropped and Burr was like, Hey man, I'd love for you to get on and just have that in New York, man, was, is something that I'll take with me forever. Um, but those yeah, moments, that's, 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 that's dope, bro. Like no, I, was, I, I feel that 100%. Like I feel that. And, and, and it's, you know, people say that there isn't, any healthy addictions, but the addiction to a moment that is transcended is perfectly fine. And I feel like that's why, and I said, actually I said on the show this morning, I said Tom Brady, like I said before on the show, has an unhealthy addiction to success because like people know what the definition of euphoria is, but majority of the world don't know what it feels like. like that, was, that was euphoria, bro. You know what I mean? And what was so, that's the best way to put it, but what was so amazing was when I had my depression and my breakdown in 16, where I didn't think I was going to get out of 16 alive, not because, not because I would ever hurt myself. The craziest part about my depression in 16 was it was so bad, Nate, that I would never hurt myself. So I thought I was going to live in hell. And mm. 
And then I thought, then I was convinced that something was wrong with me. I was convinced that I had a brain tumor. I was convinced that I had some sort of, my body was dying. I went, I went through something mentally and I was on stage in Hartford, Connecticut at the Funny Bone Comedy Club. It was a Thursday night. There's about 250 people there. And I'm on stage killing in a full-fledged panic attack at a body depressed experience opposite. And I remember seeing this table looking at me, smiling, laughing, drinking. And in my mind, I'm going, these people are laughing so hard at me right now. I'm so mentally in a panic, in an anxiety ridden, brutal hell. I'm an out of body experience of, of unhappiness. And I'm doing this and I drove home in like this slow motion haze and that's when my breakdown happened. So then to fast forward two years later or whatever it was at Madison Square Garden and be in that green room, a new man holding a drink, knowing what I did, what I just did. And so when people get depressed and they tell me, yo, Paul, like, thank you for your story about 2016 because you got me out of it. I always tell people, yo, it's going to get better. It's going, if you got it, listen, I know it's hard. I know depression's hard, but if you want to get better and you fight through it and shit, it's going to get better. And um, so when you say euphoria, it's amazing because I had both aspects. I've had, I've had the, the opposite out of body of hell and yeah. then the out of body of like, this is never, ever going to get better. I'm right there with you. I, I had a uh, previous to that, that year, that I explained where I felt like everything just went right in that one specific moment on the football field. I had tore my ACL and I went to, like you're talking about the highs and lows of the NFL. Seattle Seahawks played in Buffalo, <clears throat> first game of the season. And the first quarter, I scored a touchdown. I catch this deep bomb. <laughs> this is like prime, Nate. We're talking late 20s. I could jump as high as I've, I've ever jumped. I'm strong, I'm fast, I'm physical. Uh, I catch this bomb over to do, I literally snatched the ball from him like, on, like I'm a bully. And in my head, I'm thinking first quarter of the first game of the season, I'm gonna score 16, 18 touchdowns because I, I did it in college. So I was like, this is, this is the year where it all comes together. Um, I, I'm loving it. Shortly thereafter, I tweak my knee and I don't think anything of it. I tell the trainers, no, nah, leave, leave me alone. Like, stop, don't touch me. And I wrap it up at halftime. I put a spandex over at halftime. Um, I, I take some anti-inflammatories, which is basically just disguisers and pain pills. And I'm out there running. And I remember my calf and my knee started cramping up. And I'm like, damn, something's wrong. But being hard-headed, I'm like, whatever. I'm going to go ahead and, like, I'm going to just keep playing. Third quarter, Matt Hasselbeck's in the, in the, at quarterback. The cornerback is so far inside of me, I had an option route, which means I can go in towards him, stop right in front of me, or run an out route. Me and Matt are on the same page. He sees what I see. I'm like, I'm running this out route. I'm going to run away from this dude. I'm going to score two touchdowns, first game of the season. This is going to be the best start of my career. Two touchdowns in the first game of the season? you kidding me? Like, I'm about to be on some, like, 15, 16, 18 touchdown shit. So I, I run, and I plant my left leg. Go down. Uh, I'm like, what the hell? So the trainers come over, the doctors come over, you all right, you all right? I'm like, I don't know who tackled me. He's like, not, what do you mean? Nobody tackles you. I'm like, no, somebody hit me. Somebody clipped my leg. I went down. Like the, the DB was way in there. I was going to catch this touchdown. I just saw Matt throw the ball and it hit the ground. They're like, nobody hit you. Your knee gave out. We'll figure out what it is. Wow. So uh, I end up tearing my ACL. I go back after the long flight. I tell me, ACL, I go get my surgery in Alabama. A doctor by the name of Dr. Andrews, he, he's done everybody. Kobe, rest in peace, every major athlete, superstars from basketball to Olympic uh, athletes. So he makes me feel comfortable about like, yo, like you're, you're, you're Nate Burleson. I've did, I've, I've done like, look at, look at my wall. Charles Barkley, I don't know, whoever else you can name, I've done them. And I'm like, all right, cool. This is where, the space that you're talking about, this is where I hit for the first time. I get my surgery and I started doing rehab. Shortly thereafter, they're like, yo, week after, two weeks after, don't mix alcohol with your pain pills because that's just not cool. So like two weeks in, I'm kind of risking it. I'm like, I go to the bar. I'm staying at this local small hotel close to where my rehab is. I go down to the bar and I'm like, yo, let me get a vodka. Vodka cranberry. 
And he's like, all right, cool. Mr. Burleson, how's your knee doing? I'm like, I'm cool. Knees all right, I'm getting better. Take my little drink. I'm looking at whatever local games they have on because they don't have Seahawks games because it's Alabama, right? Next, next few days, I'm like, um, yo, let me get like a double. Make it a double. Take my little double. Next week, yo, let me get a triple. And he's like, all right. He's like, all right, Mr. Burleson, how's your knee doing? I'm like, that's cool, it's cool. I go in my room and this was set me over. And you don't realize what sets you over the top until you look back on it. I remember like trying to pay attention to the game and listen to the game and they weren't saying my name. And like later I realized I wanted them to say my name. I wanted them to say, oh, they missed Nate Burleson. Oh, like Nate Burleson went down with ACL a couple of weeks ago. Like we, we would love that. And in that moment I realized how quickly life can forget you. Yeah. Like, I was just a man. Like now they don't care. So the next time I go down to that bar, wow. I, I walk in and I'm like, yo, hey yo, hey yo, here are hundred dollars. Um, can you bring a bottle to my room? He brings a bottle of vodka. I'm up there chilling by myself, listening to the radio of NFL games like I'm in the, the 60s, you know what I'm saying? And um Whoa. and uh and I I remember drinking. And waking up, and mind you, I'm a guy that likes, I like to get in pajamas, my hoop shorts. I got a certain routine before bed. I wake up like this. And I was, I was like, I don't sleep on top of the covers. I, I like, I got a certain thing, a certain feeling, a certain mood, a certain rhythm when I go to bed. And when I woke up, I looked down, I was fully dressed. And my arms were like, they were like semi-crossed. They weren't like perfectly crossed, but they were like semi-crossed which I never sleep like that. I'm yeah. a, I'm a stomach sideways. <laughs> yeah. and, and in my head, I was like, Oh, this is, this is how people, this is how people fit in a casket. Yeah. So I was like, I'm either going to be able to control this monster, which is, um, uh, this, this, this spirit, this energy that is telling me you're never going to run as fast. You're never going to jump as high. All that stupid money that you spent, you wasted it. And you're never going to be what everybody thought you would be. Like injuries will ruin people's careers. This could ruin your life. That monster that kept repeating those things, I was like, I'm going to beat that. And I woke up that day and I was like, I'm going to beat that. So like that was, that was that state. Like you talk about that place you were in. Like I was in that same place. Wow, that's crazy, man. That's amazing. All right, last one. Is the NFL season going to start on yeah. time? Yeah, it's starting. It's starting. It's starting. But but I, I do feel like there might be some spacing, some like I, I heard some rumors that they're gonna like sell one third of the tickets, maybe half of the tickets, okay. and then space out the fans. But uh, I still I still got some I still got some reservations about that. Like you can space out the fans, but Paul, if you're coming at me yeah. and I'm blocking you and I'm like huh, and then like a little like a little like you, you remember yeah. the movie Outbreak where it's like a little just a little comes out on you you're gonna be like yeah and what happens if one player tests test positive you know does that mean that team's not gonna play like that's that's what i'm saying yeah that's, that's a that's a tricky thing do you like the um joe burrow first first pick you gotta take him first yeah yeah you gotta take him first he's the man you know what i'm saying like he he came in and he proved that he can play in a, in a perfect system and people were like yo well he had a lot of like pro players around him okay he's gonna have pro players around him in the nfl he's a pro now so Let's let's any like you see this. Joe got a certain cool about him. It's almost like he'd been here before. Like you look at him, you're like, are you are you 24 or 34? Because I saw him smoking that cigar. I was like, he he's re, he's a reincarnated person. Like there's no he's been here before. He's we we get that. Yeah, yeah. When I saw him sitting there smoking a cigar after winning the national, I'm going like, that's a grown <laughs> man. That's a, that's a grown man that fought in World War II. Like this that. LSU, like you won a national championship. That's nothing compared to what you've been through in your past life. Oh, that's great, man. Uh, Nate, thank you so much. This has been TVE four four six. We're gonna do something real quick, but thank you yeah. so much, guys. Check out uh, Nate on uh, when football starts Sunday mornings on uh, yeah. NFL Today on CBS. Yeah. Obviously, every morning on Good Morning Football on the NFL Network. Uh, you are the absolute best, brother. Appreciate you, bro.